Luther served as a professor for almost 35 years. He always taught courses on books of the Bible, and in the process he learned as much or more than his students did. He noted that the student of Scripture never changes Scripture. Rather, Scripture, which is God's own word, changes the one who studies it. Here are two of the many depictions of Luther as professor, wearing his academic robe and holding a book, which led viewers to think of the Bible. Both of these are relatively large works of art. For the moment, we concentrate on the figure to the right, which is a woodcut showing Luther as a significant person. His own outsized figure in the frame suggests his importance, as does the elaborate architectural surroundings in which the artist has placed him. It comes as no coincidence that the folds of Luther's robe run parallel to the fluting of the columns on either side of him. As Luther recognized, the two main messages of the Bible are law and gospel. Although the law should be duly honored as God's word, which teaches people to love God and their neighbors, yet the law does not show anyone how to be delivered from sin. For this, Luther said, one must listen to the gospel, which does not teach me what I should do, but what someone else has done for me. Namely, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has suffered and died to deliver me from sin and death. This was what made Luther so strong. Eternal salvation in the Christ who died for him and for all and rose again. Luther was a doctor, that is a teacher and professor, but that did not make him a one-man show. He was a member of the theology faculty at the University of Wittenberg. This debate lectern reminds us of the setting and some of the tools for Luther's teaching in Wittenberg. This ornate Baroque lectern probably dates back to the 18th century. It has two barriers. The one at floor level, where debate participants would stand, showed from right to left the crests of three university departments, the faculties of arts, law, and medicine. To the left is an open Bible and the Latin for the word alone. The presiding officer for a debate would stand at the lectern proper, which was just in front of a portrait of Luther. That is, he would stand behind the second barrier, which from right to left bore the crest of the theology faculty, a portrait of the university's first rector, and the university seal on which the school's founder, Frederick the Wise, was shown. Near the top was a crucifixion scene, and above it, in gold, the divine name in Hebrew. That piece of furniture was used for scholarly disputations. During the 1520s, it was the classroom that had turned out to be pretty much the place for teaching God's Word at the University of Wittenberg. Luther and his colleagues discontinued disputations since these smacked so much of medieval scholasticism that had the effect of burying Christ. But in the 1530s, the university statutes were rewritten by Luther's colleague, Philip Melanchthon. Formal disputations were reintroduced, for it had become evident to all that no reunion with Rome was going to be possible. So the University of Wittenberg would need not only to train future pastors, but also to train future theological professors. And disputations under the authority of God's word became another important setting and tool for teaching. Although Dr. Martin Luther was a university professor, he was also a pastor, a preacher on the staff of the city church, St. Mary's, in Wittenberg. Another man who divided his time between church and university, to a greater extent even than Luther, was the pastor at the city church, Johann Bugenhagen. Only a couple of years younger than Luther, Bugenhagen had become attractive by Luther's writings. In 1521, he went to Wittenberg and came under the wing of Luther and Melanchthon. Over the course of time, his organizational abilities became evident. He contributed to the composition of church orders for other cities and was even lent out for months at a time to help organize church affairs elsewhere. 
This portrait is from 1537, which was about the time when he went from Wittenberg to what eventually turned out to be two years in Denmark. After Luther and Melanchthon, Bugenhagen was the third most important reformer in Wittenberg. A man of many talents, he became a biblical scholar in his own right. He turned several series of his university lectures into books. He made a big contribution to the translation of the Bible from the original languages into German. And he also became pastor at the city church, which made him not only Luther's colleague, but also Luther's pastor. It was to Bugenhagen that Luther confessed his sins. For Luther had not given up private confession when he left the monastery. Bugenhagen showed himself to be quite a physician of the soul. Once he told Luther, God must surely be asking himself, what can I still make of this man? I have given him so many superb gifts, but now he questions my grace. Luther said, for me, this was an immense comfort, like the sound of angels. There was more than one way to get the good news out. Besides Bibles that could be read and professors and preachers who could be heard, there was artwork like this that could be seen. This is from Gotha, about 1540. This altarpiece displays the most extensive array of Reformation-style imagery. It has 14 wings on hinges around a fixed center panel. Prominent in that center panel is the crucifixion, the atoning death of Christ. Way at the top are scenes depicting the creation and fall, but most of the artwork here is devoted to telling the story of Jesus. He is shown, for example, as teacher, the teller of parables, a preacher, healer, and miracle worker. The story of Christ from the Gospels was shown in pictures along with words here for all to see. Luther did not want to get free of what God has created. This set him apart from other reforming figures in the 16th century. Their kind of attitude, more from Greek philosophy than from the Bible, led to stripping of art out of churches in an effort to get away from the senses into some supposed realm of the purely spiritual. Luther thought much differently. He noted that scripture did not forbid images themselves, but rather the worship of images. Furthermore, the word has become flesh. God's glory is seen in the man Jesus, never more than when he quite visibly hung on the cross. Therefore, Luther thought that not only music, but also visual art held a very important place for Christians, especially for education and edification. Luther died in 1546, where he'd been born, in the city of Eisleben. He was in town to mediate a dispute between local rulers. Three days before he died in Eisleben, he preached his last sermon from this pulpit in St. Andrew's Church. The pulpit still stands in its original place in the church, just in front of a column. During the 16th century, the original paintings that had once been on the pulpit were covered by the ones you see here, of Saints Catherine, Andrew, and Martin. Andrew, because the pulpit is in St. Andrew's Church, and Martin and Catherine, seemingly with Martin and Katie Luther in mind. For a long while, the church only allowed this historic pulpit to be used on Luther's birthday, the anniversary of his death, on Palm Sunday, and for Reformation Day. In the 19th century, however, regular preaching from this pulpit resumed and continues today. In his last sermon, delivered from this pulpit, Luther preached on Matthew 11. Here's part of the sermon. Christ says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. And it is as though he were saying, just stick to me. Hold on to my word and let everything else go. If things go badly, I will give you the courage even to laugh about it. I give you the spirit so that the burden which for the world would be unbearable becomes for you a light burden. 
At the end of the sermon, Luther said, this and much more might be said concerning this gospel, but I'm too weak and we shall let it go at that. Luther died, apparently of a massive heart attack, on February 18, 1546. He remained a staunch confessor to the end. When he was on his deathbed, his friend Justice Jonas asked him if he wanted to die standing on Christ and on the doctrine he had taught. In a firm voice, the answer came back, Yah. This is a life-size and full-figure wooden model done not long after Luther's death. From it, a bronze plaque of the same size was made to cover Luther's tomb. This wooden model is impressively painted, although the present coloring comes from the 17th century. It shows Luther in his academic gown and holding a book with a Luther rose above his shoulder. The inscription framing the likeness of Luther was provided by his colleague Philip Melanchthon. However, neither this wooden model nor the bronze grave plaque made from it ever reposed in Wittenberg. The model stayed in Erfurt, and the plaque eventually got to Jena. Luther's pastor, John Bugenhagen, preached the funeral sermon. He did not hesitate to identify Luther with the angel from Revelation 14, who had an eternal gospel to proclaim to all who dwell on earth. Philip Melanchthon, who had delivered many declamations on other great men, got up and gave a eulogy. He set Luther in the line of proclaimers of God's word that stretched back to the Old Testament and included the church fathers. Melanchthon noted that the light of the gospel could be seen more brightly when Luther spoke than when others did. And while Luther could certainly be harsh, Melanchthon even cited Luther's opponent Erasmus, who said God gave this last age a sharp physician on account of its great sickness. Luther died in February, 1546. If the Lord had not taken him from this valley of sorrows then, he probably would have been burned at the stake as a heretic. You see, in the spring of 1547, the devout Roman Catholic Emperor Charles V won a smashing victory over the Lutheran princes at the Battle of Milburg, south of Wittenberg. This woodcut from the city of Nuremberg was made shortly after the Battle of Milburg. It shows a bird's eye view of Mielberg and its environs, highlighting some of the most important people and locations in the battle that took place there on April 24, 1547. The emperor himself was on the battlefield, along with his imperial Spanish troops who routed the Lutherans. Now it was the spring of 1547, little more than a year after Luther died, and Emperor Charles had won his victory on the battlefield and was standing in the castle church in Wittenberg. It was on the door to this church that Luther had posted the 95 Theses almost 30 years before. The emperor stood beside the grave of Luther who's buried under the pulpit in the church. The Duke of Alba, one of the generals of the emperor, suggested they exhume Luther's body and drag it through the streets as that of a heretic. And Charles famously said, I wage war on the living not against the dead, and left the building. During Luther's career, he was a subject of three princes of Saxony. These men sat, one after the other, on the seven-member electoral college for the Holy Roman Empire. They were Frederick the Wise, Frederick's brother, John the Steadfast, and the man on the left here, John's son, John Frederick the Magnanimous. This painting is from after John Frederick was captured at the Battle of Mühlberg. It was done by a Flemish artist while John Frederick was being held captive in Brussels from 1548 to 1550. In the portrait, there is a scar on John Frederick's cheek, an injury from the Battle of Mühlberg, he is playing chess with an opponent dressed in Spanish garb. This is probably supposed to be the commander who had defeated him, the Duke of Alba. Yet, 
John Frederick himself remains calm and serene, even in defeat and now as a prisoner. John Frederick suffered greatly for the gospel of Christ. After his military defeat, he was stripped of his electoral title and he lost much of his territory. In fact, the emperor had initially given him a sentence of death, but it was commuted to life imprisonment shortly thereafter. Already in 1530, as a young man of 27, John Frederick had been at Augsburg with other German princes. He was one of the signers of the basic Lutheran confession that was made there at the time. He took over rule when his father, John the Steadfast, died. John Frederick himself remained steadfast. His nickname, the Magnanimous, reflects the great spirit in which he held to and defended the Lutheran confession, both before and after his defeat in battle. The psalm verse that Luther had quoted concerning all the Augsburg confessors remained applicable to John Frederick. I will speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. It wasn't only theologians and princes who stuck their necks out for the gospel of Christ during the 16th century. With this document, Emperor Charles V put an entire city under the imperial ban. It was the city of Magdeburg. After Charles won the Battle of Muehlberg, he demanded unconditional submission from all his adversaries, that is, the various cities and territories that had joined in an alliance to defend against any prospect of attack from the empire. Of all these cities and territories, only the city of Magdeburg refused to swear loyalty to the reinstated archbishop and the emperor. So, on July 27, 1547, Charles issued the document on screen. Thereby, he placed Magdeburg under his ban, which meant that this particular city no longer reposed within the Holy Roman Empire's community of peace. This caused all sorts of trouble for everyone in Magdeburg. For example, other imperial estates were forbidden to enter into any kind of agreements, political or economic, with Magdeburg. For Magdeburg, this all amounted to a loss of trade, revenue, and prosperity. But the Lutherans of Magdeburg saw no choice. The emperor's demand for submission was linked with renouncing their confession of faith, and they would not renounce their confession of Christ. At this time, courageous Magdeburg became a center for resistance as the emperor tried a broad-scale reimposition of Roman Catholic teaching and practices. Who would have thought that God would use stubborn little Magdeburg to preserve the pure proclamation of his word in the world. A king asked his court historian to summarize all history in one sentence. The historian said, well, there was this huge group of people who all lived and then they died. I've been talking to you about people who lived and died about 500 years ago, but there's more to it much more. This is a painting from 1561 showing the city of Eisleben and its cemetery. In the foreground kneel a local dignitary named Jacob Heidelberg and members of his family. Behind them on the left is the scene of dry bones rising to life from Ezekiel 37. At the center of the painting is the raising of Lazarus from John 11. To the right stands the resurrected Christ stabbing the beast of Revelation 13 as he keeps death under his right foot. The very presence of a cemetery asserts that in the midst of life we are in death. But as Luther noted, and this painting shows, the risen and victorious Christ turns that completely around. In the midst of death, the Christian is in life. Therefore, Luther could observe that he was not greatly disturbed about the future of the Reformation. After all, Luther wrote, our God is able to raise the dead. He can take care of his cause in this world. Oh, and one more thing. Years ago, the Lutheran Hour speaker, Oswald Hoffman, quoted a Swedish Lutheran bishop he knew. The bishop said, there's no gospel but the Lutheran gospel. Oswald Hoffman added, that may seem arrogant, 
but it is very true. The Bible's gospel is the gospel that Lutherans believe and preach. This never shows up more vividly than in the face of death. Life from God for poor, undeserving, dead sinners. That was what the Reformation was all about, and it's still all about Jesus.